From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! As the crisis in Venezuela continues, a mysterious U.S. air charter company based in North Carolina has halted flights to Venezuela after being accused of smuggling arms into the country. The plane had made nearly 40 round-trip flights between Miami and spots in Venezuela and Colombia since January 11th, the day after Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro was sworn Worn in to a second term. We'll speak to a McClatchy reporter who broke the story. Then we look at one of the largest public school scandals in U.S. history. It's chronicled in the new book, None of the Above, the untold story of the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, corporate greed, and the criminalization of educators. As a teacher wrongfully convicted in the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, it's clear to me that my story was a part of an even larger story about the intentional destruction of public education in this country. Shawnee Robinson was one of 11 former educators in Atlanta convicted of racketeering and other charges in 2015. But was she actually guilty? She and her co-author, journalist Anna Simonton, join us today. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. With two days left before the February 15th deadline to avert another government shutdown, President Trump told reporters Tuesday he's not happy with the proposed deal that came out of congressional negotiations Monday night, but did not say he would reject it. The deal currently includes nearly $1.4 billion to build 55 miles of new border barriers out of steel, far less than the $5.7 billion requested by President Trump. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said he hoped Trump would sign the deal. Meanwhile, Politico is reporting the White House may redirect federal dollars from various government agencies to make up for the shortfall in Trump's border wall funding demand, including tapping disaster relief funds intended for California and Puerto Rico. Trump would reportedly do so through executive order circumventing Congress. It's still unclear whether he will declare a national emergency. As the political crisis in Venezuela continues, tens of thousands of Venezuelans took to the streets Tuesday in dueling pro-government and pro-opposition protests. Opposition leader Juan Guaido addressed his supporters and announced a deadline for allowing aid shipments to enter the country. Today, we announce that February 23rd is the day for humanitarian aid to enter Venezuela. We stand by all sectors, delivery drivers, nurses, and medics, to get ourselves organized. Military officers, who in large part have remained loyal to President Nicolas Maduro, have been blocking access to supplies at the Venezuela-Colombia border. Critics have blasted the U.S. for using aid as a political tool to undermine Maduro's presidency while garnering support for Guaido. The Red Cross and the United Nations warned the U.S. to not send aid to Venezuela without the approval of the sitting president. The U.N. said, quote, humanitarian action needs to be independent of political, military, or other objectives, unquote. On Monday, Guaido tweeted a picture of himself surrounded by pill bottles, saying some aid in the form of nutritional supplements made it into Venezuela, although it's unclear where they came from. In an interview with an Israeli newspaper on Tuesday, Guaido, who declared himself Venezuela's interim president last month, said he's in the process of restoring ties with Israel. Venezuela severed its relationship with Israel a decade ago under the leadership of Hugo Chavez, who instead developed links with Palestinians. Guaido also suggested he's considering opening the new Venezuelan embassy in Jerusalem, following in the footsteps of the United States, which last year drew international condemnation after it moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a city that Palestinians want as part of a future state. Meanwhile, President Maduro continues to call out the U.S. for its role in a attempting to oust him from power. In an interview with the BBC Tuesday, Maduro said the U.S. is ruled by white supremacists. It's a political war of the American empire, of the interests of the extreme right that today governs, of the Ku Klux Klan that rules over the White House to take over Venezuela. 
In the Philippines, authorities have arrested award-winning journalist Maria Ressa in connection with a cyber libel case. Ressa is the founder of the independent news site Rappler and a vocal critic of the Filipino president. The charges stem from a story published by Rappler in 2012, in which the paper detailed the alleged criminal ties of a businessman based on intelligence reports. This is Maria Ressa speaking during her arrest earlier today. What I know is I have not gotten an official copy of the DOJ indictment. We would have the chance to file a motion for reconsideration. We should. Um, the fact that an arrest warrant has been issued, well, really interesting. And I will follow. I'm just shocked that the rule of law has been broken to the point that I can't see it. Rappler and Maria Ressa have been repeatedly targeted by Duterte's government. In November, authorities indicted Ressa and the site on tax evasion charges, which are widely believed to be politically motivated. To see our November interview with Maria Ressa, go to our website, democracynow.org, where she came to this country to win a number of journalism awards. In Spain, a trial kicked off Tuesday for 12 leaders of the Catalan separatist movement over their role in Catalonia's bid for independence. In 2017, the central government cracked down on separatists arresting political leaders and charging them with rebellion following an independence referendum in October of 2017 and the Catalan parliament's declaration of independence. Lawyers for the defendants have condemned legal proceedings, saying it's unlikely they'll get a fair trial and that democracy should not have political prisoners. This is Catalan President Hum Torra speaking about the trial. We are before an act of revenge against people who decided to decide, against people who defended ballot boxes against batons, people that put their bodies at risk to grant a better future. And it is precisely this that some have not tolerated and claimed for revenge. They wanted to punish them. The trial came two days after tens of thousands of protesters took to the streets of Madrid Sunday to denounce Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez's plan to hold talks with Catalan politicians. The protest was called by conservative leaders in Spain, including the far-right Vox Party, which opposes any moves to negotiate with the pro-independence movement. In Barcelona, thousands marched Tuesday in a pro-independence rally in a show of support for the separatist leaders. Turkey has issued over 1,100 arrest warrants to people with suspected ties to exiled cleric Fethullah Gulen. The government blames him for a failed coup in 2016. Since then, at least 77,000 people have been arrested and around 130,000 fired from government and public sector jobs, such as teaching, in a purge by the Turkish government. Gulen lives in the United States. Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan made a surprise visit to Iraq Tuesday, his first trip to the country. He said the U.S. is committed to Iraqi sovereignty following backlash over Trump's comments earlier this month that he would keep U.S. troops in Iraq to watch Iran. Following a meeting with Shanahan, the Iraqi Prime Minister, Adel Abdul Mehdi, reiterated that the U.S. mission in Iraq must be limited to helping combat terrorism. The Senate has overwhelmingly passed a major new public lands bill, voting 92 to 8 to add over a million acres of protected wilderness, adds four new national monuments, and expands eight existing national parks. A provision also prevents mining in over 370,000 acres of land around two national parks, including Montana's Yellowstone. The bill, which now heads to the House for approval, would also permanently reauthorize the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, which lapsed last year. In New York City, a federal jury rendered a guilty verdict on all 10 counts against notorious Mexican drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman after a three-month-long trial. The counts include conspiracy to launder drug money, international distribution of drugs, the use of firearms, and engaging in a criminal enterprise, which carries a mandatory life sentence. During the more than 200 hours of testimony at the federal district court in Brooklyn, 56 witnesses took to the stand with stories of murder, violence, spying, widespread corruption, and even one tale of the drug lord escaping arrest in 2014 by climbing naked through a sewer alongside a former lover. This is U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, Richard Donahue. This conviction is a victory 
for the American people who has suffered so long and so much while Guzman made billions pouring poison over our southern border. This conviction is a victory for the Mexican people who have lost more than 100,000 lives in drug-related violence. A new sweeping investigation by the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News reveals 20 years of sexual abuse allegations within the Southern Baptist Church, with over 700 victims, including many children, some as young as three years old. 380 Southern Baptist leaders and volunteers have been accused of rape, abuse and various forms of sexual misconduct. Around 220 of those have been convicted of sex crimes or were given plea deals. The report also found members Members of the church pressured some women to get abortions after becoming pregnant as a result of assault or threatened to shun them from the church. The church is the largest pro Protestant denomination in the country. The report has prompted calls for investigations into the church and their role in covering up and enabling the abuse. Eight families are suing the Trump administration for the trauma and inexplicable cruelty of Trump's zero-tolerance family separation policy. Lawyers for the families say the policy has left the children with lasting emotional scars and altered behaviors, including not being able to sleep or eat. The suit is seeking $6 million in damages for each family. The U.S. government has admitted to separating 2,700 children from their families, but a recent Health and Human Services report suggests there could be thousands more. The nonprofit Annunciation House in El Paso, Texas, recently told The Guardian they still receive calls every week about new cases of family separations. In health news, the Centers for Disease Control has confirmed over 100 cases of measles in the U.S. since the start of 2019. In Washington state, where at least 55 cases were identified so far this year, Governor Jay Inslee declared a public health emergency last month, and lawmakers are considering changes to vaccination laws. Measles is a highly contagious disease that kills over 100,000 children worldwide each year. Public health officials say the recent rise in measles cases in the Pacific Northwest is due to laws in Washington and Oregon that allow parents to easily opt out of vaccinating their children. One quarter of kindergarten students in Clark County, which is at the heart of the recent outbreak, did not receive all their recommended vaccinations. In the state of New York, reports estimate at least 200 cases of measles since September of last year, with the outbreak mostly confined to the Orthodox Jewish community, which has particularly low vaccination rates. Last month, the World Health Organization said people who choose not to get themselves or their children vaccinated constitute a global health threat. In Viejo, California, the family of rapper Willie McCoy is demanding answers after six police officers shot and killed the 20-year-old after they found him sleeping in his car outside a Taco Bell. Officers say they were called to the scene by a Taco Bell employee, although he was apparently asleep when police arrived. All six of them shot at McCoy when he made a sudden move, according to the official statement. McCoy, who was known by his stage name, Willie Bo, belonged to the rap group FBG. And the black revolutionary activist Nahanda Abiodun has died at the age of 68 in Havana, Cuba. Abiodun was a founding member of the New African People's Organization and an organizer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement. After she was charged with helping Asada Shakur escape from prison in 1979 and for her role in the 1981 Brinks armored truck robbery in which officers were killed, Abiodun escaped to Cuba, where she received political asylum. She went on to become known as the godmother of Cuban hip hop and helped connect artists through the Havana chapter of the Black August Hip Hop Project. A memorial service for Abiodun will be held Saturday in New York City. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. We turn now to Venezuela. 
uh, a North Carolina-based air freight company, has halted flights to that country following a report by McClatchy linking it to possible arms smuggling. Last week, Venezuelan authorities claimed they uncovered 19 assault weapons, 118 ammunition cartridges, and 90 military-grade radio antennas on board a U.S.-owned plane that had flown from Miami into Valencia, Venezuela's third-largest city. The Boeing 767 is owned by a company called 21 Air Air, based in Greensboro, North Carolina. The plane had made nearly 40 round-trip flights between Miami and spots in Venezuela and Colombia since January 11th, which is the day after Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro was sworn in to a second term. The flights ended after McClatchy first reported on them. Venezuela accused the U.S. government of sending the arms as part of its attempt to topple the Maduro government. Bolivarian National Guard General Endes Palencia Ortiz said this material was destined for criminal groups and terrorist actions in the country financed by the fascist extreme right and the government of the United States. 21 Air has denied knowledge of the arms shipment, saying the flight had been chartered by another company called GPS Air, which also denied sending arms. While no definitive links between 21 Air and the U.S. government have been established, McClatchy reports the chairman of 21 Air, Adolfo Moreno, as well as another employee at the company, have ties to Gemini Air Cargo, which was involved in the CIA's rendition program during the administration of of George W. Bush. In 2006, Amnesty International identified Gemini as a front company that had authorization to land on U.S. military bases worldwide. The CIA has a long history of running front companies for covert actions. Most famously, the CIA ran a front airline called Air America, which operated from 1950 to 1976. In the 80s, a CIA front company called Southern Air Transport was used to send arms to the U.S. backed Contras in Nicaragua. We're joined now by Tim Johnson, who's been reporting on the story for McClatchy, uh, joining us um, from Pennsylvania. Welcome to Democracy Now! Tim, would you lay out what you found? Well, as you mentioned, uh, th th this uh, air charter company, uh, 21 Air, went repeatedly to uh, places in Venezuela and Colombia f uh, starting January 11th. Prior to that, it had largely operated domestically, and suddenly it began to change its its uh, uh, its its patterns. And often there would be even uh, two flights a day between Miami and places in Colombia or Venezuela. Um, I actually learned about this uh, from somebody who uh, tweeted about it, uh, a gentleman in in uh, Canada who follows ship and plane movements, uh, noticed this, and we started looking into uh, the, the history of the chairman of 21 Air and saw that he, he has a number of businesses, and two of those businesses used an address in northwest Miami uh, that were previously used by a subsidiary of, of Gemini Air Cargo, which, as you mentioned, uh, was listed in that Amnesty International report as having participated in, in, in uh, renditions. Uh, now, Tim Johnson, uh, seven, a Boeing 767 is a pretty big plane, and there was the, the cache of weapons that the Venezuelan government c claims they found, while they're cl clearly lethal weapons, is not a huge shipment. I'm wondering, do you have any way of being able to tell what the manifest uh, of this flight, as well as the other the 39 or so flights that this airline uh, engaged in, uh, what uh, they were claiming to hold? Um, I, I actually don't know. We've uh, tried to, to get that, and we haven't been able to get the uh, manifest yet. Um, so, you know, what, what was aboard the other flights going to South America, we don't know. Uh, it's, this is a very puzzling case. Uh, if you look on social media and dig into the backgrounds of, of employees uh, of 21 Air and associated companies, you see that there are— many uh, accounts of employees who follow the Venezuelan opposition and opposition accounts that follow them as well. So there's certainly some sympathy uh, from employees within the company to the opposition to Maduro and Venezuela.
Talk more about the leadership of the company uh, that you investigated, based in North Carolina, uh, and explain what you mean uh, when you talk about the links to rendition under President George W. Bush. Well, uh, Adolfo Moreno is a 75 percent owner of 21 Air, and he's got many other companies, but he's been involved out of Miami. I, I don't know. Um, while the, the company is registered in North Carolina, uh, the operations uh, really are out of Miami, as far as I can tell. That's where many of the flights uh, have been operating. They have a, a huge operation center at Miami International Airport. Um, a curious uh, secondary aspect of this story is— that the company that consigned the cargo also has tangential links uh, to, uh, you know, this historical, uh, you know, the Iran-Contra uh, affair. Um, the, the head of the uh, of, uh, of GPS Air is a, a man named Jose Manuel Calvo, and he, uh, like Moreno, has many companies. And one of those companies, with uh, he, the partner that he— uh, uh, used to create this company uh, is, is a company called Heavy Lift Air. And that company uh, has a subsidiary out of the UAE that is controlled by an Iranian-American named Farhad Asima, who also had a role in Iran-Contra. So there's all these circumstantial things, but there's really no smoking gun that I could tell. It, it, you know, this may be just circumstantial. Are you reporting this new now on Iran-Contra? what you're saying. And explain, for people who aren't familiar with the Iran-Contra scandal, um, uh, this happening under the Reagan-Bush years, the selling of weapons to Iran to take that money to uh, support the Contras in Nicaragua, which violated U.S. law, the Boland Amendment. Yes. Um, so, that scandal involved uh, Southern Air Transport, which is also was a uh, a CIA uh, front company uh, that really, you know, exploded into the news back in 1986 because the Sandinista army shot down a twin-engine plane uh, that was run by Southern Air Transport that was uh, taking uh, armaments to the Contra rebels fighting in, in Nicaragua. Um, so Southern Air Transport uh, was actually uh, heavily involved in in all the the arms shipments to Iran. And from the Middle East to the uh, to the Contra rebels in in Nicaragua. Well, the, uh, I th I want to ask you about uh, uh, Eugene Hassenfuss, who you mentioned in your article in 1986. He was aboard a U.S. plane that was shot down in Nicaragua while on a secret mission to bring arms to the Nicaraguan Contras. He was the only passenger to survive. I want to turn to a documentary made by Wisconsin Public Television called "The Eugene Hassenfuss Story" from 1991. It featured an excerpt from the station's initial coverage of what happened to him in 1986. A Wisconsin man has been the focus of international news this week. 45-year-old Eugene Hassenfuss of Marinette was captured in Nicaragua after his cargo plane was shot down. At a press conference Thursday, Hassenfuss said his mission was directed by the CIA, but U.S. officials say the flights were privately directed. Mrs. Sally Hassenfuss joined her husband in Nicaragua this week. Hassenfuss has been jailed and may stand trial. The documentary also featured an interview with Eugene Hassenfoss's wife, Sally. The next morning, I tried to call President Reagan. I thought, well, it's the only place I'm going to get answers. He's, you know, I, I should be able to trust him. He's the president. And I knew he knew. He put me in touch with a man named Elliot Abrams. He said, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you're talking about. And I got angry, and before I hung up, he did admit that he knew what I was talking about. And he kept warning me that, you know, be careful of the press, and you know, be careful what you say, be careful what you do. And uh, interestingly or coincidentally, Elliot Abrams is now the special envoy of, of, of the White House uh, to Venezuela. I'm wondering, your— uh, assessment of this affair back then, the impact it had on uh, what was going on at the time in terms of the war on the Contras? I'm not sure I can really speak to historical impact, but, of course, it, you know, it, I, I think it helped lead to negotiated uh, settlement leading to the, uh, the elections in Nicaragua in 1990, because uh, 
uh, it, it was, you know, clearly uh, a, a major impact on that. I, but I really couldn't speak further to that. But this whole issue of Eugene Hassenfuss, this former Marine, a mercenary, shot down over Nicaragua, then held by Nicaragua, eventually released, and his contact um, with the U.S. government at the time, and now you raising this issue in your current piece around the arms shipment that— um, was found going into Venezuela. Not clear exactly if there's a connection to the U.S. government, um, but clearly the U.S. government is very overtly supporting uh, the attempted uh, overthrow of Maduro explicitly. Um, and these flights starting a day after uh, Maduro's inauguration on uh, January 10th. Well, yes, there's a lot of these coincidental links, and it's worth uh, paying quite close attention to. Uh, again, I, I, I use coincidental only because uh, we don't we don't really know. Uh, it, you know, other people point out to me that uh, th there are many people that could be have a vested interest in this. Uh, whether the arms were really aboard that plane, or is it possible that they? This was uh, something that was uh, ginned up by the Venezuelan government to rally support for Maduro. I don't know. I, I just—we uh, we haven't been able to determine for a fact that those weapons were loaded aboard that 767 in Miami, uh, that somehow they passed through the, you know, the normally rigorous screening by TSA for air cargo. Uh, these are things that are just uh, yet to be investigated. And, and has, has the company answered the— uh uh, in terms of, as you mentioned, they normally were not traveling uh, to Venezuela and Colombia. The 40 flights, what they were actually uh, carrying, or, or are they saying that they just didn't know? Both in, in both have been very uh, uh, limited in what they've said, other than denying that they knew what the cargo was. Generally, an air charter uh, company would uh, trust uh, the consignee of the uh, of the freight to handle, you know, any declarations. I believe, and uh, for its part, GPS Air said, "Well, it was, you know, it, it it doesn't know what was in the cargo." And finally, back to that issue of rendition. Though you don't know exactly who this company was working for, what you do have a record of is the company being involved with the U.S. government uh, during the President George W. Bush years, being involved with rendition and having clearance to land on any military base in the world. Um, can you explain what those renditions, so-called, what some called kidnappings, were about? Well, basically, the renditions were to take suspect, uh, t terrorist suspects uh, following 9-11 uh, for interrogation in black site jails uh, scattered around the world. I, I, th there were a number of them in, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. I know there was one outside of Chiang Mai, Thailand, uh, elsewhere, and these were used to, uh, to you know, forcefully interrogate, you know, waterboard even uh, uh, suspects in the war against terror. Uh, so these rendition flights uh, were uh, commonly used in the period after 9-11. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Tim Johnson, McClatchy reporter, who's been covering national security and technology issues since 2016. His recent article headlined, Venezuela says plane from Miami delivered weapons for use by enemies of Maduro. Um, Tim Johnson was part of a team that shared a 2017 Pulitzer Prize for its investigation of the Panama Papers. Earlier in his career, he spent two decades as a foreign correspondent in Asia and Latin America. We'll link to your piece at democracynow.org. When we come back, none of the above. The untold story of the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, corporate greed, and the criminalization of educators. Stay with us. Whiskey for you, I'll fly gone. Bush League pilots can't get the job done. We got the fly the canyons, you never see the sun. No such thing as an easy run. I'm 
a treetop fly yeah. Top Flyer by Stephen Stills. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we turn now to the fight for public education as the teacher strike in Denver heads into its third day. District and union negotiators worked late into the night Tuesday on a potential agreement, including a base salary of 45800 a year for educators. That would be a $2,500 boost from their expected pay for 2019-20 school year. But the Denver Classroom Teachers Association is still demanding the district rely less on bonuses and instead focus on financial security for educators. Denver's teachers are striking for the first time in a quarter of a century. Their walkout comes just weeks after an historic six-day teacher strike in Los Angeles ended with victory for educators demanding smaller class sizes and higher wages. The actions are the latest in a wave of teacher strikes that began last year in Republican-controlled states like West Virginia, Oklahoma and Arizona. The strikes have brought renewed attention to the plight of the American public school system, which teachers say is under attack. We're now joined by a former educator who says the teacher strikes can help shed light on one of the largest public school scandals in U.S. history. Shawnee Robinson is a former first-grade teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, who was convicted for what prosecutors said was her role in the massive cheating scandal that roiled the school district and drew national attention in 2015. Robinson was one of 11 former educators convicted of racketeering and other charges. Prosecutors say teachers were forced to modify incorrect answers, and students were even allowed to fix their responses during exams. This is Judge Jerry Baxter speaking after the verdict was handed down. He ordered most of the educators immediately behind bars, an unusual move for first-time offenders. I made myself plain from early on, and they have made this decision, and they have, they have, they have not fared well. And, and I, I don't like to send anybody to jail. It's not one of the things I, I get a kick out of, but... They have made their bed, and they're going to have to lie in it. And it starts today. Two of the convicted former educators turned themselves in in October to begin their prison sentences. Nine were sentenced to jail but rejected sentencing agreements in order to appeal. Twenty-one defendants avoided trial with plea deals. The case has fueled criticism of the education system's reliance on standardized testing and elicited calls of racism, because 34 of the 35 educators indicted in the scandal were African American. Shawnee Robinson has written a new book on the cheating scandal with journalist Anna Simonton. It's called None of the Above, the untold story of the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal, corporate greed and the criminalization of educators. In the book, Shawnee Robinson writes, the dominant narrative that developed about the scandal rarely acknowledged the bigger picture. Federal policies that encourage school systems to reward and punish educators based on student test scores, a growing movement driven by corporate interests to privatize education by demonizing public schools and land speculation correlated to new charter schools springing up that was gentrifying black and brown neighborhoods across the country. We're joined now in our New York studio by Shawnee Robinson, who's still awaiting an appeal in the case. Also with us, Anna Simonton, independent journalist, editor for Scalawag magazine, graduate of the Atlanta Public Schools, co-author with Shawnee Robinson of None of the Above. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So you are appealing these charges. I mean, you basically uh, were charged under laws to get the mafia. Correct. I was facing 25 years in prison. Um, I was charged with racketeering and false statements in writings. 
So explain, lay out the story. Go back to 2013. Tell us what happened. So the APS cheating scandal was Atlanta a period, public schools. the Atlanta public schools cheating scandal was a period of time in which educators were accused of changing their students' answers from wrong to right on standardized tests. And so I was actually a teacher for three years in Atlanta public schools. And my second year teaching, I was a first grade teacher. And that later becomes the year in question. 2009. In 2000, yeah. right, 2009. And as a first grade teacher, my test scores actually did not count toward the district targets, which were benchmarks imposed by the APS school board and administration, or the federal standards, which was adequate yearly progress. And so in October of 2010, I get a phone call from a GBI agent, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, um, and he asked me to come in to, strangely, a, a mall parking lot is where I met him. And he tells me that there's been an erasure analysis done for the entire state of Georgia. 20 percent of the schools over the entire state of Georgia were flagged for high um, erasures. Explain erasures. So the, the erasure analysis was basically looking at how many times a student, right, a student went from wrong to right. Erases their answer right, and makes and it right. Right, from wrong to right, right. After a certain amount, it's like statistically improbable outside of human intervention. And so the agent told me that in my class specifically, there were high levels of wrong to right erasures. And he asked me, can I explain this? And I say, no, I can't explain this. And then he asked me, well, did any administrators or the principal ever place any pressure on me to cheat on my students' test booklets? And I said no. And then he pulls out a pre-written voluntary statement form, which was basically saying, you don't have any knowledge about cheating, you didn't cheat. And he asked me to sign this form. Now, the thing about this form is that later it's used against many educators who signed the form. They were charged with false statements in writings, which is a felony. And so teachers were really put between a rock and a hard place because here you have a GBI agent. And mind you, there were no attorneys present. I didn't have an attorney present. And when they went into the schools, teachers were pulled from their classrooms and interrogated. So there really were no attorneys present. And so you have this GBI agent asking you to sign a form um, and if you don't sign the form, you didn't really want to become a target, you know. But if you did sign the form, you could potentially become a felon. Now, let me ask you, the entire investigation, it was touched off, wasn't it, by a series in the, uh, the Atlanta Constitution that began questioning the the uh, the percentage of erasures that they were uh, uncovering uh, uh, in their investigation? What impact did that series have on the general Atlanta community? And obviously, it touched off uh, the law enforcement officials. Right. And there were, at that time, I believe there were about, um, it was over about, there were about five schools on, across five districts. Um, and so that prompted the governor to do a statewide investigation. And so, and just to even go into as far as like the widespread cheating is concerned, um, over 40 states in this country have had evidence of cheating allegations. 14 of those states, it was considered to be widespread. In Washington, D.C., there were 103 schools that were flagged for high, um, suspiciously high erasures or test scores. Um, so this was actually something that was happening across the country. Um, so we what we can't figure out is why teachers in Atlanta were slapped with felony charges. Some of my co-defendants were facing prison sentences of up to 40 years. And, uh, uh, Anna Simonson, I'd like to ask you in terms of the broader picture. Now, this happens. Uh, these indictments come down in the middle of the uh, Obama administration. President mm -hmm. Obama and Arne Duncan, his education mm -hmm. secretary, were very much into performance-based measures of uh, of teachers and standardized testing as a as a way as a key way to measure whether a student is doing a good job. Could you talk about the pressures that were put on educators and not only the educators but their supervisors, their principals, and their superintendents during this period of time? Yeah, this was a, a long-running trend beginning in the early 1990s when high-stakes testing began to be utilized uh, in school districts like Houston's. 
Um, but it was really codified in federal law in 2001 with No Child Left Behind, um, which was signed by George W. Bush. Um, but Obama really continued the um, policies of No Child Left Behind in, in practice, if not in name. And one uh, interesting piece to this story is how our governor at the time, uh, Sonny Perdue, used the same 2009 test scores to apply for a $400 million Race to the Top grant. So Race to the Top was a grant uh, under the Obama administration that for um, states that could show that they were doing some of these education reforms that the federal government was pushing, so expanding charters, increasing high-stakes testing, um, that they could get federal funding. And so at the same time that Sonny Perdue sends in GBI agents to the schools of Atlanta uh, because he suspects that the 2009 CRCT test scores are fraudulent, he's using those same test scores to say, hey, look, our test scores are going up. And they did win that $400 million federal grant. And Anna, why did you get involved with Shawnee in writing this book and none of the above? You, too, went to Atlanta Public Schools. Why was this so interesting to you? I did. I had to take these tests, and they were uh, they were uh, a drain on the actual education that I feel like students should be getting in the classroom. They're, um, in my view, a waste of time. Um, but uh, more important is that my middle school counselor was actually convicted in this case. I, like many people, watched the convictions handed down, not having really followed the trial. It was an eight-month trial, the longest criminal trial, excuse me, in Georgia history. Um, and so it was hard for people to kind of understand what was happening as it dragged out. But when the convictions were handed down, it was, like, heartbreaking to see someone who I remembered, you know, being this, like, beacon in my own childhood, um, along with these other teachers. And so when Shawnee reached out to me, it was just a wonderful opportunity to um, do something about it and try to tell another side of the story. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guests are Anna Simonton, independent reporter, editor for Scalawag. Um, also joining us is Shawnee Robinson. She was the youngest of the teachers convicted in the Atlanta cheating scandal. She is appealing her conviction. Two teachers just recently went to jail. This is Democracy Now! Their book is called None of the Above. We'll talk more about it in a minute. No Fear by the Filipino musician Noel Cabangan. In the Philippines, authorities have arrested the award-winning journalist Maria Ressa in connection with a cyber libel case. She's the founder of the independent news site Rappler and believes, as do many human rights groups, that uh, President Duterte is going after them. To see our full interview with Maria Ressa, you can go to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're continuing our discussion with the authors of the brand new book, None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed and the Criminalization of Educators. Journalist Anna Simonton is with us, as well as co-author Shawnee Robinson, who is the youngest of the 35 um, teachers and staff charged in this scandal. Juan? Well, I want to ask Shawnee Robinson about this whole issue of high-stakes testing, the impact that it has had on, on teachers, not only in Atlanta, but across the nation. As we now know, there was a huge parent movement that developed to opt out, and, and uh, many states, there were huge percentages of parents who refused to have their kids be tested constantly anymore. But what was the impact on, the, on, on educators uh, as uh, authorities and state legislatures insisted on raising these test scores and constantly testing? the kids. I actually think it, it was devastating because 
teachers were constantly having to teach toward the test. And, you know, that can really stifle your creativity in the classroom. Um, and so, yeah, that's the main thing. And I look at other countries like Finland, who don't have high stakes testing, who continue to outshine other countries with academics. Um, so just this push and this overemphasis of high stakes testing and even how it's led to racketeering charges, you know, um, I just think that it was blown way out of proportion. I want to go to. Uh, well, you well, follow no, up no, I just wanted to ask in terms of some of the key figures. For instance, the the Atlanta superintendent of schools was also charged and eventually ended up uh, passing away before uh, yes. she could be brought to trial. Right? Could you talk about the impact on the individuals in this case? Um, and you know, I really did not know you're spe- uh, referring to Dr. Beverly Hall. Um, I never met her. Um, pretty much, who I was in contact with were our principals. Um, so as far as that aspect, you know, I can't really speak to Beverly Hall. Um, but I will say, as a first grade teacher, I wouldn't say that I've experienced as much pressure as maybe a third through eighth grade teacher might have faced because my test scores did not count. But there was definitely pressure um, just from the educational policies and the overemphasis of high stakes testing. Let's go to Beverly Hall, the Atlanta School District's former superintendent. Among those charged was painted by some as the one who orchestrated the uh, test cheating. Um, you write in your book, Shani, uh, from the moment Hall was selected to lead APS, Atlanta Public Schools, in the spring of 1999, she was under a microscope. Everyone is watching her, wrote the Atlanta Journal Constitution from Governor Roy Barnes who's hammering out his statewide school reform effort to corporate leaders, college presidents, and parents considering whether to entrust their children to the urban public schools. Hall faced up to 45 years in prison, but died from breast cancer in 2015 before going to trial. She maintained her innocence. Um, I then want to go to Dana Evans. Dana Evans is the former principal of Dobbs Elementary School, who was convicted in the test cheating trial. This is Evans on PBS NewsHour in 2017, responding to allegations that educators participated in cheating for financial gain. I got bonuses one year out of the four years uh, that I was a principal, and it was $1,000. And I gave more than $1,000 to Dobbs. I paid for kids' uniforms, and I paid people's rent in their gas bills, and it is offensive that that I would cheat for $1,000. That was Dana Evans. Um, You both write in the book also about Donald Bullock, an educator who accepted a plea deal in 2015 in order to receive a reduced sentence. He apologized for his role. I, Donald Bullock, do hereby sincerely apologize to the students, my fellow staff members, parents, and the Atlanta public school system, as well as the greater metropolitan Atlanta community for my involvement in the 2009 CRC administration resorted in cheating or other dysfunctional acts. You both write in the book that Bullock, quote, endured the shame of reading an apology after maintaining his innocence for so long, only for Baxter to slap him with five years of probation, six months of weekend jail, a $5,000 fine, and 1,500 hours of community service. Anna Simonton, tell us what happened um, with uh, the different people involved, from apologies, plea agreements to, in Shawnee's case, she's appealing. Yeah, so uh, 35 educators were originally indicted. Uh, Many of them took plea agreements, and many of those folks, their plea agreements required them to testify uh, in this trial. So 11 folks actually went to trial, and the trial itself was uh, nonsensical. So there were witnesses who recanted on the stand and said, actually, I um, just said what I said in order to get this plea agreement, and I never was under the kind of pressure that uh, that I'm now supposed to testify against uh, my former colleagues about. So uh, additionally, witnesses were contradicting each other to the extent that the judge, Jerry Baxter, said perjury is being committed here daily, and yet he didn't strike those testimonies from the record. He didn't allow for a mistrial. 
Um, everything was very much slanted toward the prosecution. Six months of prosecution witnesses compared to a few weeks of defense witnesses. So by the time that the convictions were handed down and sentencing happened, um, Jerry Baxter had become emotionally volatile, uh, patronizing, and that's where we see him uh, demanding apologies, and not only that, but demanding that folks give up their right to appeal, which is really why many of the defendants did not want to apologize and yet were portrayed in the media as, um, we've heard the word, provocative, as if they were flaunting somehow um, their moral obligation. But in fact, they would have had to given up their constitutional right to appeal. So those are just some of the things that made this trial incredibly unfair. And what about the sentences that Judge Baxter uh, handed out? What kind of a message did that send across the country to educators uh, uh, everywhere? An incredibly chilling message. Um, and his emotional volatility to, to, was to the point where he actually, uh, at first, uh, sentenced the school reform team directors, so these are administrators, with 20 years in prison, which was, or, excuse me, 20 years uh, to serve a fewer number of years um, and the rest on probation. But that was beyond what the prosecution was actually asking for. So uh, he was, yeah, he was just, like, slamming down the gavel on educators. And can you talk about the racial disparities in this case? 34 of the 35 people charged, including Shawnee, African-American. Yeah, and, and all of them people of color. No white teachers were charged, even though white teachers were implicated in the original Georgia Bureau of Investigations report. Um, another sort of example is how, at the same time that the GBI was investigating Atlanta public schools, they actually did an equally in-depth investigation into Doherty County schools. This was one of the districts that was flagged in the state's original um, statewide look at the erasure analysis. And Doherty County had uh, cheating going on on par with Atlanta public schools, according to the GBI. And yet the local uh, district attorney there did not bring any charges. And one of the big differences was that their superintendent was a white woman, whereas Beverly Hall is a black woman who is a rising star in the field of urban education. Has anything changed in Atlanta public schools in terms of student achievement, in terms of how uh, tests are administered, and in terms of their sense of uh, modernizing and corporatizing public education? Um, if anything, this has reinforced the kind of corporate education reforms that uh, we feel contributed to the conditions that created the cheating scandal. Um, so the narrative was constructed in a way to say, look how terrible public schools are. They're rife with corruption. They're failing. We need charter schools as an alternative. We need more data-driven education instruction as an alternative. That's going to be the answer. And in fact, our governor at the time, Nathan Deal, introduced legislation on the day that the prosecution rested. So the media was full of, like, recaps of how, you know, horrible teachers were. He introduced legislation to create something called an opportunity school district that was modeled on Louisiana's recovery school district, uh, which would enable the state to take over so-called failing schools and turn them into charters. As a result of amazing grassroots organizing, that was actually turned down. But other similar reforms um, have been put forward to um, continue those attempts. You both document uh, in the book the history of the destruction of the black communities of Atlanta because of gentrification, poverty, the war on drugs. How does this link to the cheating scandal? Well, in, in a broad sense, it poses a question, who is really cheating these children? <laughs> if we think about cheating in terms of a lack of opportunity, um, and some of the same people who were involved in blowing this so-called cheating scandal out of proportion uh, have contributed to the harm of black communities historically. So Mike Bowers was Georgia's attorney general for many years, later was a lead investigator looking into Atlanta public schools. As attorney general, he was one of the main people pushing for tough on crime laws that um, vastly expanded mass incarceration in Georgia, led to generational trauma that students are now bringing to school. In his 1996 bid for governor, he called children super predators, black children, trying to drum up fear in his white voter base. And then a few years later, he's on the news, one of the most vocal people saying, oh, these poor children have been cheated by teachers. And, and Shani, what about the local elected officials? So uh, Atlanta has always been seen as a progressive city with a considerable uh, African-American progressive uh, political leaders. Where were they when all of this was happening? Uh, well, that's a good question. Atlanta has always been known as the city too busy to hate, so it's all about image. And historically, black and white elite have worked together to decrease any racial tension. And so, you know, it begs the question, 
why were so many black teachers, educators charged? You know, it's almost in a sense of if you can make a situation look like it's more black on black crime, you have you decrease that level of racial tension. Um, but in our book, we detail Atlanta's history of displacement and destruction. Um, and so we feel that the criminalization of black teachers was just the next chapter in that legacy. Shani, talk about what happened to you, how this impacted you. Um, you were pregnant at the time? I was pregnant during the entire eight-month trial. And it was emotionally and mentally draining. It was also financially draining. Um, we were in court Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5. And... You know, just to the most disheartening thing to me, the way it was portrayed in the media was that educators cheated on their children's tests to get a payout. And so that's why it was, you know, this big talk about how we had cheated the children. The lead investigator on the case testified that bonus money provided little incentive to actually cheat. And so my bond was about two hundred thousand dollars and it was one of the lowest Others were— $200,000? Mine was one of the lowest. There were others that were in the millions. And so just the media portrayal of it, it was really making it seem like we had gotten all of this money. My school, we actually did not meet our targets, so I've never received one penny of bonus money ever. My test scores did not even count. Um, And I didn't cheat. On what grounds are you appealing? Well, the first step— And my attorneys have been working diligently on getting the judge to recuse himself. During the trial, right before the verdict was released, he told the jury, whatever your verdict is, I will defend it until I die. So based on his own words, we already know where he stands on this case. He also had a private conversation with the district attorney. And when that came to light, our attorneys asked for a mistrial, but he denied it. There was a situation where he even tried to assist one of my um, one of the state witnesses with identifying one of my co-defendants. Um, there was a, a woman who was asked to identify one of my co-defendants. And so she started walking around the courtroom and the judge called out to her and said, you're getting cold. And so the woman turned around and started walking in the opposite direction. She never recognized my co-defendant and eventually returned to the witness stand. And so it's hard to believe that a judge can be impartial after doing so many things like that. Um, And he retired and they reassigned our case to another judge. But somehow this same judge, Judge Jerry Baxter, has been allowed to continue to preside over our case. You know, we began this segment by talking about the Denver strike. Anna, how do you see this story linking into this bigger story of teacher strikes across the country? I think it's deeply connected. I think that um, some of the same conditions that are uh, sparking teachers to take to the streets and protest and and to the halls of their capital state houses, um, these issues of privatization, draining resources from the classroom, these are all things that were driving forces of the cheating scandal in in the way that the narrative was constructed to demonize public schools in order to further um, the privatization of public schools. Um, I also think that there's this, you know, in the sort of resurgence of this education justice movement, a focus on black educators in particular with things like the Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action. Um, And so folks are really looking at um, racial injustice in the education system in a way that I think this case is sort of the epitome of. And the impact on charter schools in Atlanta? Have they have they have they grown since this? Yeah, there's been each year an, an increase, although the overall number uh, has not gone, gone up a whole lot because there's often one, new ones that open close. And so that's part of the problem with charters is a sort of fly-by-night situation. We do have 20 seconds. I know you're both presenting none of the above at CUNY Grad School here in New York tonight at 6. What message do you have for educators, Shani? Um, just to stay strong. And I just want people to know that the APS cheating scandal was a manufactured crisis that scapegoated black educators and distracted everyone from the real problems that are undermining public education. We thank you so much for being with us. Again, their book, None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed, and the Criminalization of Educator Shawnee Robinson, the youngest of the teachers convicted in 2015. She is appealing that conviction, and journalist Anna Simonton, co-authors of the book None of the Above. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.